Before the 1940s, people often died from heart arrhythmia. This was a common disease, but why it occurred was still unknown. The normal healthy heart has its own pacemaker that regulates the beats of the heart. However, not all hearts beat regularly. Sometimes this causes heart failure. This problem required a solution that allowed portability and freedom for the patient. Out of this problem came a great innovation in history, the development of the pacemaker. The idea of pacing the heart can be traced all the way back to the 1800s when electropuncture became the accepted method of stimulating muscles, nerves, and organs beneath the skin. The inventor of the first cardiac stimulator defibrillator is unfortunately unknown due to a case of parallel development. However, in the 1930s, Albert Hyman claimed to have designed and constructed several different resuscitators to provide first aid to victims of fatal arrhythmia. Unfortunately, no record of the Hyman pacemakers exists other than a one-page article in the October 1933 edition of Popular Science. This pacemaker weighed 16 pounds and had to be wound every six minutes. It was used on rabbits in the first test. Hyman also claimed to have resuscitated a patient with his pacemaker during his service in the U.S. Navy Medical Corps during World War II. This was a very early example of a cardiac pacemaker, but Hyman's contributions to science brought respectability to the medical use of electricity. In 1949, an engineer named John Hopps was assigned by the National Research Council of Canada to participate in an experiment with stimulation of the sinoatrial node to predict cardiac arrest while undergoing surgery. Hopps also claimed to have designed other artificial pacemakers, and he tested his first examples on animals. Hobbs designed the first catheter electrode for cardiac stimulation. This was used on the right external jugular vein of the animal and a vacuum tube operated the external pacemaker. Atrial pacing was achieved and control of the cardiac rate was accomplished. During World War II, Paul M. Zoll began to work on an external pacemaker which was to stimulate the heart across the closed chest. This version of the pacemaker was the line current operated and put out a maximum of 150 volts. Output stimulation and voltage rates were controlled from the front panel of the pacemaker. The electrodes consisted of two one-inch diameter metal discs placed on both sides of the chest and held in place by a rubber strap. They made contact with electroconductive liquid to move the charge along. The longest period of stimulation was reported to be 11 days. However, Stimulation was painful and usually left skin burns. The beginning and end of stimulation was by manual switch operation. In 1952, the first newspaper articles concerning the pacemaker were published. This changed the general public's concept of resuscitation of patients with heart block. In 1958, a Swedish team using the pacemaker designed by Rune Elmquist and Ake Senning made the first implantation into a human. This first device failed after three hours. A second device was then implanted that lasted for three days. Arne Larson was the world's first implantable pacemaker patient. He survived the first tests in 1958 and died in 2007 after having 22 different pacemakers during his life. In February 1960, an improved model of the pacemaker was implanted in a patient in Montevideo, Uruguay. The device lasted until the patient died of other causes nine months later. In the 1960s, the American Wilson Greatback constructed devices that were used in humans following extensive animal testing. His first human patient lived for 18 months following surgery. The early devices, however, had battery problems and every patient had to get an additional operation to replace the battery. This device allowed the patients more freedom to move around and regain their lives. The nuclear device, which weighed three and a half ounces and was about two-thirds of the size of a pack of cigarettes, was developed by the Atomic Energy Commission with the Nuclear Materials and Equipment Corporation of Apollo, Pennsylvania. The radioactive plutonium is housed in a case that looks like a small film roller. Attached to the roller are six pairs of tapes called thermocouples, which convert the heat generated by the radioactive source into electrical energy. The resulting current runs into a tiny electronics unit 
which produces the pulse that stimulate the heart to beat. The disadvantages of this pacemaker were that the recipients were unable to leave the country and it did not have diagnostic capabilities. This particular type of pacemaker only made the heart beat. The first American-made nuclear pacemaker was developed and implanted at Newark Beth Israel Medical Center in Newark, New Jersey. Irregular heartbeats can have several forms. The two main irregular heartbeats that qualify someone for a pacemaker are bradycardia, which is a slow heartbeat, and tachycardia, which is a fast heartbeat. There are five types of pacemakers that are in use today. Demand pacemakers, which discharge electrical impulses when needed. Fixed rate pacemakers, which discharge electrical impulses at a steady rate. Triple chamber pacemakers are useful for patients with a weak heart muscle. Rate responsive pacemakers adjust to change in people's physical activities so they can raise or lower a heartbeat. Single chamber pacemakers have one lead. The lead is usually attached to the right ventricle. Rate responsive, single chamber, and dual chamber pacemakers are the most frequently used pacemakers. All pacemakers have the connector, which is the part of the generator where the leads are attached, and the generator, which sends out electrical signals. Leads are wires covered by soft, flexible material. Anchors are the tips of the leads that attach to the heart muscle. All pacemakers have a rate responsive feature. Now a pacemaker can adapt to all patients' needs. When active, the heart beats at a faster pace to meet the body's needs for more blood and oxygen. However, problems with the heart's electrical system can prevent the heart from speeding up. The rate responsive feature can solve this problem. This feature can automatically adjust the heart rate as needed. The pacemaker has a normal pace while resting, but speeds up when active. After receiving the pacemaker, the patient can return to their normal routine. Some pacemakers can even be checked at home. Pacemaker patients can use a device that sends signals from the pacemaker over the phone. By doing this, the doctor or technician can review this information and decide if the pacemaker settings need to be adjusted. However, this source isn't available in all areas. If the battery begins to run low, the pacemaker sends out a signal that can be seen during tests. If the battery is low, the doctor will schedule an appointment to replace the batteries. However, the pacemaker will continue work normally in the meantime. Over time, the pacemaker settings may need to be adjusted. This is done by a process called programming. To adjust the settings, the doctor places an electronic wand over the pacemaker. Radio signals from the wand give the computer inside the pacemaker new settings. Programming a pacemaker is done painlessly and in a non-invasive way. The pacemaker is very reliable. Batteries last five to 10 years. The pacemaker's battery is sealed inside, so replacing the battery means replacing the entire generator. This is done with a simpler and shorter procedure than when the first implantation is done. Patients can even go home the same day. After long-term use, the leads of a pacemaker can wear out as well. The procedure is very similar to the one the patient has when the first pacemaker is implanted. It's not hard to live with a pacemaker, and it's possible to do almost everything. There are only a few things a person should not do with a pacemaker. Some things to be cautious of are electronic signals that could interfere with the pacemaker's operation, but the popular myth of microwave interference is just a myth. People with a pacemaker should be sure to carry an ID card listing their pacemaker status. They should also be sure to see a doctor and get regular exercise. Pacemaker patients have something good to say about it. Take Kathy Bluffton for example. Throughout history, the pacemaker evolved and became dramatically smaller. The very first pacemaker was big, bulky, and had to be carried around everywhere. Burns and scars were common results of these pacemakers as well. The smaller, modern pacemaker is internal and the battery lasts much longer. The pacemaker can adapt to patients' needs as well. Every year, thousands of lives are saved due to the innovation of the pacemaker. As Dr. Mark Cohen said, there's nothing more important than the quality of life and the pacemaker helps you keep that quality.